We've had Thanksgiving. Was a good time? I have an idea that it's the wrong word. I think Thanksgiving needs to be called thanks receiving. Because don't we give thanks for all the good gifts that we've received? We're going to have a look at that a little more today as we, as we continue. There is an aspect of giving, though, that is mentioned by the wise man in Proverbs, and that's been part of our series. We've been studying, for those that are visiting today, we've been studying and doing a series on the book of Proverbs. We've been looking at practical Christianity and the practical stuff that confront us as Christians living in this mixed up, complicated world with all the challenges that that brings. Turn with me to Proverbs 21 and there verse 26. Proverbs 21 and verse 26. <clears throat> My Bible reads, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. The godly love to give. It's something they love to do. Proverbs 11, verse 24, 25, give freely. Proverbs 11, verse 24, give freely and become more wealthy. That is biblical math. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. We need to remind ourselves of these promises, don't we? Proverbs 22 verse 9, a generous man, Proverbs 22 verse 9, a generous man will himself be blessed for he shares his food with the poor. Who, and then we have Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, verse 27. Proverbs 28, verse 27. Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to poverty will be cursed. I have an idea that we've seen a lot of good, positive Christianity in this last week. And we've seen people give in many ways. You have given. Last week we saw all these kids bring these things. We saw you pack the boxes. We saw you take food to those that were needing that. And thank you, Melinda, for organizing that. We happened to come together as a church family and blessed our community. We are working with YCAP. We are working with our community. And that's a good thing. Some of us are ever reached out to people that were like our neighbors. Or people that we know, not through some official program. You just did something nice out of your own to, for somebody else. And if you did that, how did you feel? But we're not living in an age that is all beautiful and Thanksgiving happens and the surprises happen and they come and we get the box when we don't expect it and when we really need it. We're living in an era of what? We're living in a time or, a day or an era of entitlement. And uh, this little goodie is not seeming to work. So let's see, keep pressing, pressing it and make sure it works. <laughs> there we are. There we are. Living in an age of... It, it, it nearly, if you read it quickly, you would have said, we're living in an age of enlightenment. But is it an age of enlightenment? Yes, knowledge shall increase and men shall run to and fro, right? But so will the worries increase and the conflicts increase and the junk of this complex modern society in which we're living. We're living in an age of entitlement. What does that mean? 
entitlement. Here's an idea if some of you don't know. In 1960, the parents to little junior, these grades are terrible. 50 years later, 2010, the same parents, this time to the teacher, these grades are terrible. Do you notice there's a difference? Entitlement? What does entitlement do? Spoiled kids become spoiled adults. Giving our children everything they want makes them demanding and ungrateful and keeps them from learning self-control. The generation gimme, 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 gimme. I want, and it's not fair, are two of the favorite statements of this entitlement generation we're living in. Have you heard those words? I want, and it's not fair. Now, in case some of you over here think I'm just gunning at you, I'm just preaching at you, I've not got any individual in this church family in mind on this sermon today. If the cap fits, wear it. It's not a case of I speaking to somebody specifically. It's just a, a, a disease which is part of our society. I'm sure you've seen it. The word entitlement, what does it mean? The word entitlement is fed by three other family members. It has more than just one. It has at least three and perhaps, perhaps many, many more that make up this concept of entitlement. And this is who they are. Family member number one is called self-pity. And because I have not been dealt well with, I'm entitled to. Low self-esteem means I just feel bad about myself. And so I try to act in a way that makes me get what I think I deserve. And narcissism, that's just plain self-centeredness. And because I'm selfish, I want and I want it now. The trouble with entitlement is it robs us of joy with gratitude. However, joy is double. Gratitude begins where your sense of entitlement ends. Gratitude begins where your sense of entitlement begins. So, if we speak about thankfulness, the opposite seems to be this concept of entitlement. Sometimes it's good to look at the opposite to get a better understanding of what we mean. So the definition of entitlement, one I have is an entitlement uh, mentality is a state of mind in which an individual comes to believe that privileges are instead rights. Privileges are rights. And that they are to be expected as a matter of course. A strong sense of entitlement is one of the signs of narcissism. I'm reading a dictionary definition. That's what the dictionary says. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. What does that say? Proverbs 29 and there, verse 15. I'm reading this from the message. It says, Wise discipline imparts wisdom. Spoilt adolescents embarrass their parents. Spoiled adolescents embarrass their parents. Seems to me Proverbs knew something about entitlement. Now, Parents, you're going, to, you're going to feel good about this sermon today. You're going to sit there and be all smug and say, yeah, see, told you. You need to be disciplined. You're not going to get, get away with everything. But um, there may be some challenges for you too. So keep listening. In 1 Kings chapter 1, we read about a guy by the name of Adonijah. Adonijah, 1 Kings 1 verse 5 I'm going to read this again from the message. It just explains it so beautifully in modern language. 1 Kings 5, uh, 1, 
verse 5 and 6. At this time, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, puffed himself up saying, I am the next king. He made quite a splash with chariots and riders and 50 men to run ahead of him. His father had spoiled him rotten as a child, never once reprimanding him. Besides that, he was very good looking and the next in line after Absalom. Adonijah. David's time was coming to an end. And Adonijah aspired for the crown. And he apparently was a spoiled brat, but he was even very good looking. He was a handsome guy. I have an idea that every time he looked into that brass mirror or into the water of the, of the, of, of, of the, the lake or whatever, he must have puffed himself up and said, I am really good looking. Wow, these people deserve to have a good looking king. And, and I'm it. I'm it. A lady in the social sciences uh, researcher, Diane Barth, said, people who feel less entitled seem to have better relationships and greater self-esteem than those who present themselves as more special than anyone else. Interesting. What is the difference between being confident and being entitled? Doesn't, don't they seem about the same? If a person is very confident... How do I know he's not just being entitled? Listen to this. Confidence, confident people believe in themselves and their ability to succeed, but they also believe in the realistic possibility to fail. Entitled people believe that the world owes them and resources to succeed. They have an unrealistic belief that they should not fail and will blame and judge others if they do. See the difference? So confidence is I believe that I can succeed, but I'm realistic enough to know that I could fail. Entitled people say, no, I believe the world owes me all the help and resources I need to succeed, and if I fail, then they've not helped me and they've not supplied what I need and that's their fault. You know some people like that, don't you? It's hard. It's tough to get on with them sometimes. We're learning a lesson here about the opposite of gratitude and Christian graces. And it, lest we say, um, well, you know what? These things don't affect Christians, right? <laughs> not really. We all part of the human race, and this is the type of thing that affects all of us. Have you ever felt self-pity? I have. I have sat on my pity pot at, a t at times. I remember as a kid, I sat on a pity pot so much that I said, Mommy doesn't love me, Dad doesn't love me, I'm going to eat some worms. And I ran away from home. I think I've told you the story before. I ran away from home, came home late that night, found myself at the dinner table, as if nothing had happened, and I felt so mad because my parents didn't even miss me. But I felt so sorry for myself. What does entitlement look like? Here's some ideas. A mother feeds herself while letting her children go hungry. A spouse frequently spends money from the joint account on luxury items without telling his spouse. A teenager defiantly uses drugs and expects his parents to bail him out when he gets caught. A woman shows up at a function or party she has not been invited to. A middle-aged man makes no attempt to save his, uh, for his retirement, assuming his family will pay for everything. An irate customer demands products and services that they've not paid for. I had an interesting experience just yesterday. 
If you don't mind sharing, it just comes to mind right now. <laughs> I received this book from these book companies, you know. <laughs> I once ordered one book and I got it. Beautiful coffee table book, you know. And a year later now, I get another book and I can't remember that I signed on to it or asked for it. Maybe I did in this automatic thing that you sometimes forget. Anyway, I, only, I wanted to get this thing back and I couldn't get it. I don't know what to do. I don't want to pay another 25 bucks for a book that I didn't want. One is enough. So I called up the folk and they said, well, no problem. If you haven't opened up the box, I said, no, I haven't opened up the box. But I have ripped the envelope off to see what it was all about. Well, if you can put the envelope back in an, 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 the, the letter back in the envelope and just take it like it was, take it to the post office, and they'll, just, they'll accept it. I went there yesterday, and the lady said, sorry, sir, this is going to cost you six bucks or something. I don't feel like paying nothing for this thing. I didn't order it. I don't want it. They said I could send it back, and you guys would take it. Sorry, sir, if the, oh, it's opened up, the envelope, blah, 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 we can't take it. I said, okay. I decided to be nice. And I went out and sat and got in my car outside the post office and I called up the company somewhere on the East Coast. And I said, sorry, your advice failed. The lady was nice enough to say, okay, they did not accept that. Hmm. And in my mind, I was thinking, guess what? If she's horrible to me, I'm just going to tell her she can come and fetch my book. It's on my doorstep. She can come get it if she wants it. That's what I was thinking. Fortunately, I didn't portray that and say that. I was just nice and I said, what do I do now? You know what she said? She said, no worries. Keep the book. Compliments of the season. It's yours. Wow! Well, sometimes if you treat people nice, even you're thinking bad thoughts, they treat people nice. <laughs> nice comes back to you. The irate customer demands products and services that they have not paid, even paid for. Or an angry parent wants a school to make impractical concessions or arrangements for their child. Because I feel entitled to. Don't you know who I am? Do you know who you're talking to? You know how many times I've felt like saying that, Rick, <laughs> to somebody? <laughs> Don't you know who you're talking to? I was afraid if I said, I'm a pastor, they'll say, a what? <laughs> it's hard for entitled people to feel thankful or show genuine gratitude. It's hard. An entitled person cannot say thank you easily. We find that unthankfulness is featured in Scripture. Turn to Psalm 78 quickly. Psalm 78. Here we find an interesting passage where David writes, verse 15 to 17 in Psalm 78. It talks about a whole series of things that he mentions there that God did for Israel in the wilderness. He brought them out of Egypt. He gave them miracles. He led them out like a mother would lead a child. He did all these amazing things for them. And then it says there in verse 15, he split open the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them water as from a gushing stream. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow down like a river. Verse 17, yet they kept on sinning against him. Is that ungrateful or what? Rebelling against the Most High in the desert. He did all this, these things for them. They were not thankful and they kept on sinning. Verse 18 to 20, and I'm reading this in the message again. They try to get their own way with God. They try to get their own way. Clamored for favors, for special attention. They whined like spoiled children. Why can't God give us a decent meal in this desert? Sure, he struck the rock and water flowed, creeks cascaded from the rock. But how about some fresh baked bread? How about a nice cut of meat? In modern language, we would probably say, uh, how about a nice pizza or a fat piece of steak? Hosea 13, another passage. 
Hosea 13, verse 4 to 6. Again, the message. I'm still your God, the God who saved you out of Egypt. I'm the only real God you've ever known. I'm the one and only God who delivers. I took care of you, says God. During the wilderness, hard times, those years when you had nothing. I took care of you, took care of all your needs, gave you everything you needed. You were spoiled. You thought you didn't need me. You forgot me, says God to Israel. Hmm. So why is gratitude good? It's interesting. A guy by the name of Dr. Robert Emmons, known as the world's leading scientific expert on gratitude. I didn't know there was someone that was just specializing in that, but this guy has apparently studied that. He's from... University of California, Davis, and he, uh, he studied and researched the concept of gratitude. And he reveals why gratitude is good for our bodies and our minds and our relationships. What good is gratitude, he asks. We've studied more than about a thousand people from ages 8 to 80 and found that people who practice gratitude consistently report a host of benefits. What are some of those benefits that he finds. Physical benefits, he says, stronger immune systems. People that are grateful, stronger immu uh, immune systems. Less bothered by aches and pains. Would you like that? Be more grateful. Lower blood pressure. People who are grateful exercise more and take better care of their health because they care about that. Sleep longer and feel more refreshed when waking. A lot of physical benefits. They say grateful people, according to research, live about seven years longer than the average. The um, psychological benefits. Gratitude, people who have gratitude have higher levels of positive emotions. They are more alert, alive, and awake. They experience more joy and pleasure. They more optimistic and happier people that are grateful. And then there's the social. Benefits of gratitude, more helpful, more generous, more compassionate. People that are grateful are more forgiving, are more outgoing, feel less lonely, and are less isolated. I mean, this is amazing. This is research that's done in the social sciences. Gratitude, it's not happiness that brings us gratitude. It's gratitude that brings us happiness, right? Hmm. So the social benefits are especially significant here because, after all, gratitude is a social emotion. I see it as a, re a relationship-strengthening emotion because it requires us to see how we've been supported and affirmed by other people, said this Dr. Emmons. Indeed, this cuts at the very heart of my definition, he says, of gratitude, which has two components. Firstly, he says, it is an affirmation of goodness. We affirm that there are good things in this world, gifts and benefits we've received. This doesn't mean that life is perfect. It doesn't ignore complaints and burdens and hassles, but when we look at life as a whole, gratitude encourages us to identify some amount of goodness in life, and that's what's important. The second part of gratitude, he says, is figuring out where that goodness comes from. We recognize the sources of goodness as outside of ourselves. Agree? It didn't stem from anything we necessarily did ourselves in which we may take pride. We can appreciate positive traits in ourselves, but I think, he says, true gratitude involves a humble dependence on others. It's not easy to receive a gift graciously, is it? We accept something from others, not only from people, but from God. From God that we receive these gifts, big and small, to help us achieve this goodness in our lives. What good is gratitude? 
So what's really behind these research results? Why might gratitude have these transforming effects on people's lives? A few pointers. Number one, gratitude allows us to celebrate the present. It magnifies positive emotions. We don't get hung up on the guilt of the past or the fear of the future. We can experience the present with real joy because we are grateful for what we have. Very often, positive emotions wear off very quickly. Our emotional systems like newness and novelty. They like change. We adapt to positive life circumstances so that before long, the new car has become an old car. And the new spouse, oh dear, hopefully not become an old spouse, but the new house become an old house. They don't feel so new and exciting anymore, right? But gratitude makes us appreciate the value of something and when we appreciate the value of something, we, exact, we ex extract more benefits from it. We are less likely to take it for granted. Nobody wants to feel taken for granted. And when you get used to something, it's easy to get to that place. Thankfulness helps me to renew the old, to repackage the old. So guys, go repackage your wives. Just don't tell them you're doing, doing that. Repackage the old in something new so that you can be grateful. Your mind needs to go back and appreciate what you have right now, today. Secondly, gratitude blocks toxic negative emotions such as envy, resentment, regret, emotions that can destroy our happiness. And there's even uh, recent evidence included in a 2008 study showing that gratitude can reduce the frequency and duration of episodes of depression. This makes sense. You cannot feel envious and grateful at the same time. If you envy your boss or you envy your colleague who got the job and you didn't get the, uh, the raise, out the door goes gratitude. The two feelings are incompatible. Number three, grateful people are more stress resistant. There's a number of studies that show that in the face of serious trauma, adversity, and suffering, if people have a grateful disposition, they recover more quickly, get back on their feet quicker. I believe gratitude, says uh, Emmons, gives people a perspective from which they can interpret negative life events and help them guard against post traumatic stress and lasting anxiety. Number four, Grateful people have a higher sense of self-worth. I think that uh, because, that's because when we are grateful, you have the sense that someone else is looking out for you. Your relationships give you self-worth. A kid, where does he know that he's somebody special? If it wasn't for that relationship that his dad says, my boy, you're my boy. I'm proud of you. It's relationships, and we as children of God know, I'm not so sure that the social sciences can teach us that lesson, but we know that even though we've got no family <laughs> to give us a sense of self-worth, we know we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, and that we get the heart, the core of our self-worth from Him who paid the price on Calvary. What are the challenges to gratitude? One is the self-serving bias that we have. That means that when good things happen to us, we say it's because of something we did. When bad things happen, we blame other people or circumstances. Gratitude really goes against the self-serving bias because when we're grateful, we give credit to other people for our success. And if you can say, you helped me, you helped me, you helped me, thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Last Sabbath was a success because there were many people that contributed, all of you. Melinda helped because she led out, but we needed a leader. And we needed all of you to bring all the amount of food, that mountain of food that we had back there in the foyer. Everyone together made it a successful venture. Gratitude also go against our need to feel in control of our environment. That is what we call entitlement. 
Sometimes with gratitude, you just have to accept life as it is and be grateful for what you have. Have you noticed that some people want to control the environment? If the environment gives me something I don't like, I want to control it. I want to control it. And I don't know the difference between what I can and what I can't. So the serenity prayer is something I cannot pray. I can't know the difference between what I can and what I can't control. And don't worry, Don. Sometimes we can't control these newfangled stuff either. I am with you. Don't worry. Cultivating gratitude. How do we do this? First, as most of you have heard and known and some of you have done, keep a gratitude journal. How many of you have tried to do that? Just write down all the things you're grateful for every day in a gratitude journal. Wow. List five things. What does that do? It at least disciplines me to focus on that, and I, it's hard copy. Hopefully you're not doing that in your phone, which can erase or something. But anyway, so if you have a little tangible book there by your bedside and you write it down, it's there and you can read it uh, the next day and it reminds you. You can also use concrete reminders to practice gratitude. Like somebody suggested, have a gratitude jar in your house, right there in your house, in the kitchen somewhere. And at the end of the day, you come home and take your wallet, opened up all the small change like I did this week when I walked into one of the stores and there was a Salvation Army ringer and the thing was ringing and I looked in my wallet and I said, you know, this thing is so fat that Velcro doesn't even want to hold it together anymore. My wallet doesn't want to close and it's not because of all the money in there. I've just got plastic money in there anyway. But sometimes I have to use change and so it just fills up my thing. So I opened it, unzipped it and I... And he just stood there with a big smile and I thought, well, that's good. Now, I, you've, I'm helping you, but you're also helping me. So now my wallet is thinner and it can close okay. <laughs> Do that in the gratitude jar. And then when the gratitude jar, jar is filled after a couple months or at the end of the year, then take that, especially with your kids, in a family with children, and then take that jar and all decide as a family on some project you want to help, some person, someone in need, and use that in a specific tangible, concrete way to help somebody. I know a number of you are supporting children's orphanages or an individual child overseas in India or Africa or somewhere or Asia. And uh, I think that's amazing. It helps to get me out of my selfish entitlement, focused on somebody else that I can help and do something for. Finally, gratitude contradicts the just world hypothesis. You know, this world is just. Is this world just and fair? Uh. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people, right? Wrong. Bad things happen to good people and vice versa. Life is not fair. The writer of Ecclesiastes certainly agrees with that. If you wanted to go and re read, have fun, go read Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and chapter 9 and see how that he indicates how unfair this world is. It doesn't always act in a fair way. He really debunks this belief of a just world. Someone made the com comment, it's a good thing we don't get what we deserve. I'm grateful because I get far more than I deserve. That is gratitude. That is gratitude. This goes against a message we get a lot in our contemporary culture, which says, I deserve the good fortune that comes my way, our way, that we're entitled to it. If you deserve everything, if you're entitled to everything, it makes it a lot harder to be grateful for anything. So... Practices like the, the gratitude jar, the journal, help us to stay focused. But we can take gratitude to a higher level, you know, put it up a notch. By not only focusing on what we receive, but also what we give. Mother Teresa apparently was asked once, what she feels about gratitude. She said, I'm grateful about the fact that I can help people. 
who are sick and dying in the slums of Calcutta because they enabled her to grow and deepen her spirituality. So, as we said, it's not thanksgiving as much as it is thanks receiving, but thanksgiving too, yes. Giving also helps me and can help me to feel gratitude. That's a different way of thinking about gratitude. Gratitude for what we can give as opposed to what we receive. How do you help someone who has just heard they have cancer and three months to live? How do you help a person like that? What can you give them? Do you tell them simply, buck up and count your blessings? Remember how much, uh, you know, to still be grateful for? Processing a life experience through a grateful lens does not mean denying negativity. This world is full of it, right? It is not a form of superficial happyology. Everything is happy, happy, happy. It's not this kind of a superficial positiveness which is just happy, happy, everything is happy. There's some hard, real stuff to deal with, right? It's part of life. It means reframing a loss into a potential gain, recasting negativity into positive channels of gratitude. Life is suffering. No amount of positive thinking exercises will change this truth, writes Dr. Robert Emmons. Life is suffering. As our young people will say, life sucks. Not always, guys, girls, not always. But often it does. Often it does. And then what? At such moments, gratitude becomes a critical cognitive process, a way of thinking about the world that can help us turn disaster into a stepping stone. If we're willing and able to look, he argues, he says, we can find a reason to feel grateful even to people who have harmed us. We can thank that boyfriend, listen now all those young people over there, we can thank that boyfriend for being brave enough to end a relationship that wasn't working. Why? Because it wasn't working. Hmm. Wow. I can be grateful for the homeless per uh, person for reminding us of our advantages and vulnerability. I can be thankful to the boss for forcing us to face new challenges when I got fired. I can see in the negative stuff of life something positive that I need to reframe in my mind. Gratitude is therefore generated by at least three things. Gratitude is generated by, we said, receiving, and that's what we usually say in Thanksgiving, what I get. Number two, by giving, like Mother Teresa, we can give to others like we did last Sabbath. Or by suffering, receiving, giving, suffering. How on earth can gratitude be generated by suffering? Can I be thankful when I suffer? How does this work? How does this work? Wow. Hmm. That's, that's kind of hard, isn't it? What did Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 5.18? Be thankful in the experiences during summer, but not those in winter. Be thankful for the good experiences not for the bad ones. He says, be thankful for all circumstances. In all circumstances. Does that include suffering? Does that include when I have that diagnosis of cancer? Wow. Acts 5 and verse 40. In Acts 5 and verse 40, let's have a look at these two experiences. I want to share just in closing two experiences from the book of Acts. Firstly, the apostles, and the second one is from Paul. So, <clears throat> be thankful in all circumstances. Acts 5, verse 40 and 41. They called the apostles and had them flogged. That means beaten. Not just a two hits. 39 hits. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council weeping, angry, and complaining. Is that what it says? Mine says, rejoicing. How can you walk away from a beating rejoicing? 
rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. That is gratitude in suffering. Acts 16, verse 23, the second experience. Acts 16, 23. They, that is Paul and Silas, were severely beaten and then thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, not complaining and bemoaning their fate and showing how entitled they were because they worked so hard for God. Why are we sitting in this dirty dungeon with our backs bleeding? They sit in this dungeon and they sing hymns to God. Thank you, Jeff. They sang hymns to God. They worshipped. And the other prisoners were listening. Were listening. Guys, I don't know about you, but I, I'm grateful for experiences like this in Scripture. I'm grateful for the experiences of people that have gone through extreme suffering and still came forth to praise God. For the martyrs through the ages that were tied to the stake as the flames were going around them and they were singing like Paul and Silas, praises to God. Gratitude in the face of suffering, the highest form of gratitude. This brings us closest to an understanding of the cross of Christ by experiencing our own cross. The highest form of gratitude is gratitude in the face of suffering. There are some of us I know that are sitting in this uh, church today that are suffering more than others. Some of us don't uh, have any pain. And I must praise God this morning, not bragging, because it's not me, obviously not. Thank you, Lord, that right now I don't have any toothache. I even had to go to the dentist right on Thanksgiving. Can you believe that? We've got some good people in this church. <laughs> I've got no pain in my body right now, and I pr thank God for that. But some of you can't say that, right? Some of you are sitting right here now with some pain. And it's not just pain. Some of you are sitting here with dreaded diseases and certain diagnoses hanging over your head. Do you know how long you're going to live? As the doctor told you, Two months? Six months? Five years? Some of us are sitting here. Some of us are not here. Some of us are in a hospital or in a rehab center or somewhere else or at home and not able to be here because of these physical problems, challenges. Can I be grateful? If you're sitting there now and you have the challenge of some illness, are you grateful? I hope you don't mind, Dave, if I mention last Sabbath you saw Dave was baptized. Did you see how he was, how he was struggling? He had this vertigo thing that was really <sighs> causing so much anxiety for this man. But he would not let the devil get the better. He wouldn't let the devil win. And he said, I'm going through with this baptism because I've decided to follow God according to his word all the way. The next morning, Sunday morning, he texts me and he says, first morning in weeks that I wake up Without vertigo. And his response was not, I did it. His response was, praise the Lord. Now, Dave, I know you're still not quite there. I know you mentioned to me just yesterday that, yep, you still, there's still a, a little, but there's still remnants of that there. But you are so much better, so much that you can be at church today and 
feel relatively good. It's still working its way out. And we continue to pray that God will guide you and bless you. I know others in this church are struggling with their own stuff. Gratitude is going to help you to heal. Gratitude is going to put all the defense mechanisms in the body into, into gear. Build up my immune system so that the body can help heal itself. And God uses that. As children of God, do we have any excuse for not being grateful? There's some of us, between now and yet next year this time, that may not be here with us, that are sitting with us in this church. Did you know that? We know that in this church. There's some of us that uh, are now healthy. By next year, this time, we will not be healthy anymore. Whatever challenges come, prepare your heart. Prepare yourself now and say, God, I'm your child. And I'm grateful for every breath. I cannot order tomorrow, but I can experience right now. And I praise you for this moment. Let's Talk to him right now. Lord, as we bow our heads right now and as we open our minds and hearts to you, I want to thank you that you have given us all the precious gift of time and that we have this moment in time to make good decisions and to make a positive choice about no matter what we're experiencing. And if our uh, experiences at the moment are negative, suffering, hurt, pain, whatever, may we deliver that up to you and say, Lord, it's hurting. It's realistic. We're realistic about it. It is hurting. It is painful. But we lift it up to you and we are thankful for the suffering that you give and that you enable us to go through that suffering. That you will help us through that and if it be your will, you will take it away. And we praise you for every step we take. We belong to you. We recommit our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen.